Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members of the Senate. I, I pledge to you that, uh, that my debate, this is so long as my voice lasts, that my debate will, uh, for all of the bills before us that have to do with education, will, will conclude today. I will likely not comment further because my comments do apply to everything that is before us. But I want to tell you a story. Stories are always good, aren't they? Tell you a story about a five-year-old. Just happens to be my, my oldest granddaughter. Well, she, I have to correct that. She's seven now. But the story occurred when she was five. It was towards the end of a session a couple years ago. And it was one of those sessions where things had not gone particularly well for me. And I was really, I'd gone home, was pretty grumpy and, and not too happy. So as I like to do, and the weather was good, Katie and I go for a walk, and, and we pick up rocks and toss them, do all kinds of things, and talk along the way. And this little girl was listening to me grumble and moan and complain about my plight in legislative life. And she stopped, stooped down, picked up a rock, and I thought she was going to tell me something about this particular rock that's some uniqueness. And instead of doing that, she looked up at me right square in the eyes and said, Grandpa, sometimes you just have to laugh at yourself. So sometimes we do just have to laugh at ourselves. But what became true then, and what I believe is true today, is that really out of the mouths of babes and infants, truth comes. Strength comes. The psalmist said that first, I believe, but it's still as true today as it was then. I'm really proud of, of the people of Boise County. I'm really proud of the people of Elmore County. They've behaved well. Last night we had a meeting in, in Elmore County of about 250 folks there, parents and teachers. They behaved very well and they made their, their will very clear to me. And there was a number of high school kids there. And they spoke pretty clearly about what it was they wanted. And then there was this. I, I didn't make it for you to pass around, but you get the idea. This is a petition. I promised Dominic I would show it, so make sure you get this petition. Dominic had decided that he, would, he was concerned in his, in his class. They talked about what was going to happen in their classroom. So Dominic got all of his fourth graders, it's not very official looking, but got all of his fourth graders to sign a petition in opposition to the legislation before us. But what do fourth graders know, right? What do high school kids know? It's too emotional. They're not informed, and they're certainly not taxpayers. But they will be one day if we educate them appropriately, and if we give them the strength to know what it is they should do. I'm not sure what we've been teaching our constituents who are watching this morning, but I suspect that the lessons have not been real great. We've received lots of emails, all of us have. And I know that even in District 22, even among the people there last night, there's going to be people divided. I already promised them that this morning I was going to make part of them mad at me and part of them happy. That's, that's the way this is going to be. We're going to be divided. But, but let me talk about, just for a little bit, about wh where I fall out on all of these. And th this has not been a secret because this has been talked about in the halls and around and it, in many different places. As with most problems that I've ever encountered, encountered what I have learned is that, that when, when confronted with a problem, one of the first things that, that I really needed to do was understand what the problem was, what really was the source of the problem. And if I could adequately do that, then I could determine what solution ought to be an appropriate solution. So when I started to look at, at what was broken, 
what appeared to be broken or, or what these bills were trying to fix, then, then I, I tried to do that. What, what is the problem we're fixing with these pieces of legislation? And I started having difficulty trying to understand what the problems were. But it appeared that some of us believed that the problems were the union. And if we could simply get rid of the union, then some of those problems would go away. Some believe that the problems were student performance. And if we could get rid of the unions, and if we could fire teachers, and if we could do all these other things that we're trying to do, somehow student performance improves with increased class sizes and, and more technology and fewer teachers, student performance looked like we were trying to fix that. And it looked like we were maybe trying to fix that we had determined that as another problem was, was teacher accountability. And that if we could maneuver uh, more kids into the classroom, and fewer teachers and make them more accountable to the school boards, then, then that would help somehow. We didn't address the ESL. We didn't address the IEP kids. And yet all of that has become a very real part of why our teachers are struggling. We didn't really address, or it looked like that we were trying to address, administrative dysfunction. We had the ability, we're told, and I believe it's so, to terminate teachers who are not doing their job right now. So why aren't administrators able to do that? Maybe there are some legal mechanisms that slow them down. But in the end, this legislation really doesn't get to that except that now it's easier to fire teachers. So somehow that makes that administration better. One of the other problems that looked like we were trying to solve was poor parental involvement. I, I don't know how we fix that, but, but clearly if we're taking more, doing the other things that we're trying to do with these pieces of legislation, that looked to me to be one of the problems we were trying to solve. And for the most part, it looked like what we were really trying to do the problem we were really trying to solve was the cost of education. We simply believe that it's too expensive to educate the way we've been doing it. So using an opportunity, a, a shortfall, using an, an, an imminent fiscal crisis, it looked like the problem was there and that then we would design everything around some possible cure for that imminent fiscal crisis. And yet, in the legislation, we don't even know what this is going to cost. I, I haven't seen it, and I don't think I've missed it, an, an exhaustive representation to the legislature of what all of this will cost. And in part, that's, I understand that, because there's no way to calculate what some of these changes will cost us. There's no way to calculate what's going to happen when some of the electives, as I know they will, in Mountain Home and Idaho City and Glens Ferry and Garden Valley and Horseshoe Bend, when those electives are gone and those kids that, that are hanging into high school simply because of those elective classes, when those kids are no longer in school, I don't know what that cost is going to be. So I'm not surprised we can't determine that. I, I, I don't see and I haven't understood why we haven't also wanted to talk about that, that financial part of this. I, I know as we did in 06 and other times, we move right up to a crisis. We move right up there to a crisis and then we try to fix it rather than embrace it. And we throw these band-aids in as we did with property tax reform. And we said this legislature appropriately responded to our constituents and they said fix the property tax problem. We did that and in very real ways we destabilized 
or educational funding when we did that. And now the people, the very people that we were trying to help are coming back and saying, wait a minute, what, what did you do? And, and now they're saying, because they're getting their property tax bills, and they're saying, it looks like I'm paying more on my property tax than I was. Y yeah, you are. Because now we're forcing locals, local decisions, I agree, but local decisions where there are really no choices, it's really not local autonomy, it's really not a local decision. So now we're forcing lo locals to pass supplemental levies, we're, we're forcing them to do these things and they're recognizing that we've shifted the burden. I, if I'd had my preference, this is what would have been. Step one, that we actually determine what it was, what problems we were wanting to solve. Really determine the problems. And then step two would be to bring stakeholders together to authenticate that those problems that we think are the problems really are the problems. That it isn't just our perception, but they really are the problem we're trying to solve. And then present to me legislation and a plan that puts all of that in place. I reject the idea that we had to do all of this or none of it. I reject the idea that we had to, we had to do it today because I think what today we should have done, should be doing, is adopting a plan that has decision points, that has stakeholder input, that has all of these things in a, in a way that we know what reform we want, in a way that we know where it is we're going to go for the future. I think the plan should have recognized that there are solutions that don't fit everyone and should have taken that into account. Don't make Idaho City School District compete with Boise School District or Mountain Home or Glens Ferry. Let's have a plan that's precise, specific, that identifies funding mechanisms, that talks about the future. A plan that recognizes that at some point we're going to have to talk about taxes because taxes and education are inseparable. One impacts the other no matter what. We didn't have to talk about raising them, but we sure needed to have that as a part of the plan. That at some point there was going to be a decision point where we had to, where we had to make a decision whether we were funding education sufficiently or we were still inefficient in our plan. We needed to have in this plan ability to identify some local funding re relationships so that when we're doing these things, how much are we shifting to the counties and, and cities? How much are we shifting? And is that really the policy that we want to pursue? We should have been able to decide that along the way. And we should have really identified in this plan this issue of the 21st century mobility. Because certainly, we know that kids are more mobile than they once were. Families are more mobile. And certainly in Mountain Home, where there's people, there's, they can change by 20 or 30, two or three times a year because of the air base. That was a big issue for them, that 99% guarantee of the ADA, a huge issue that we just couldn't give up on without an alternate plan that addressed those mobility issues. And I think such a plan exists given time to do it. We should have been able to, as a part of this plan, talk about what kind of policies that we wanted. And I'm coming to an end, Senators, I promise. <clears throat> we should have been able to talk about policy and the role of technology. I wasn't afraid of that piece. Many folks were. But I think we could have overcome that. We could do that. But, but also in my district, I have families that will not allow the Internet in their house. I respect that. I have families that, that go for miles and there's not even a phone line there. These technology pieces are important and they are our future, I believe that, but that there were too many questions having to do with, with how that was going to be implemented, what was going to happen along the way. Maybe 18 months, 36 months is good enough, I don't know, but we should have had in our plan 
a determination of what policy it was we were trying to pursue, what policy was going to solve a problem that we had discovered in phase one of our plan. And we should certainly have, have had a policy on the role of online classes. We should. And which schools will, will no longer have... Senator, I urge you, even though there's three bills, uh, Excuse rule, me. rule uh, 24 is specific that you have to keep your debate limited I, I to the bill that's in front of us. Thank you. I apologize. So there were a number of policy considerations that we really ought to be doing along the way, having to do with each and certainly with this one today. Is it the policy that we eliminate the ability for people to have unions that we, that we, is it our policy that we will have teachers competing against other teachers? Is it our policy that we will indeed have parents able to evaluate teachers. I spend a lot of time in classrooms. Every Monday when I'm not here, I'm in a classroom. And, and I know what goes on in that classroom, so I'm about to tell you another story. But we need a plan to go forward. We do, I, can, I agree with that completely. We need a plan that takes us forward. We need a plan that has reforms in it, we, but we need to understand what those reforms are. And I just don't, don't believe that this is the plan. Now here's the final story. And in a, there's a second grade teacher in Mountain Home, and this story I, I witnessed. Part of my job as it relates to uh, the second grade, besides trying to pass once again the second grade, Part of my job was to help these kids read and evaluate how they were doing. And, <clears throat> pardon me, and this, when I walked in to, to sit at my little table where I'd call students over, when I got in there, the teacher was sitting at the head of this crowded room, sitting on the floor with all of her little students around her. And this teacher's really good at when students begin to disrupt, then whatever that particular disruption might be, she has them do little contests. So in this case, she was reading a story to them and one of these little kids began to make faces at the other kid across the way. So in, the genius of this teacher is that, that she just stopped the story and without making a fuss about it, invited every child there to to think about what their worst face would be. If you could make a face at somebody, what would it be? What would that face be? And she gave them just a few seconds to figure out what their face was, and then she said, okay, now when I'm ready, I want everybody to make that face. And they did. They all made these faces. And this one little boy sitting right beside the teacher turned and made his face to the teacher. She made hers to him and they started laughing, and their foreheads just touched, making these faces and laughing. That, that's no big deal, is it? Except that it was magical. It was absolutely magical. And senators, so what, what you do today is going, and then in the next few days will be very important. But I'm going to tell you that we have to protect that magic. That's the difference. That's the difference right there. And if we mess up that classroom, the magic won't be there. In my classrooms, the ones I've visited, they're not broken. There is something that's broken, but it is not in my classrooms. They're just fine. Thank you. For the debate.